I haven't always been a product manager. Um, I started my career in Paddy Power, and I did see a few faces from Paddy Power hanging around. So I started my career in Paddy Power uh, 12, 13 years ago in support, and I've done various roles in support. So an agent that was senior agent, uh, training, uh, team leader. Um, and that was really, I look at that as kind of my training ground for product. And the reason that was my training ground for product is because I'm a non-technical product manager. I see all these roles around saying technical product manager. I'm non-technical, I can't write a line of code. And I'm going to admit something here today. I don't know the difference between Java and JavaScript. Um, but uh, so my strength is really based on my customer service background. I I I, I understand customers. I talk to them. Um, I know what really what, what really drives them. So that's that's the strength that I, I kind of lean on as a product manager. Um, so while I was in Paddy Power, I got an opportunity to move into the product team. Um, I was offered a job as a product manager one day by a, by a woman who'd come in as head of mobile. And uh, the first thing I'd done, I accepted it of course, the first thing I'd done was went back to my desk and I googled what's a product manager. <laughs> um, and it's about five years later and I'm still close, close to answering that, I don't quite know yet though. Um, and then from Paddy Power, I've done a couple of years there working on our mobile, pro mobile products, got to work on some really cool features, uh, work with some really cool people. Uh, from there I got an opportunity to work with Zendesk. So does anybody use Zendesk? So Zenis makes beautifully simple customer service software. So I looked after their mobile apps and uh, I started from scratch with the dev team at their mobile SDK, which launched towards the start of last year. Um, and then from there, uh, after going back and forth to San Francisco and kind of experienced that, experiencing that for a while, uh, I wanted to get something closer to home. So I moved on to Daft.ie, uh, who are uh, a property portal. So if you've got a property you want to sell or let, you go to Daft, you list it, and you know, we've got a few million viewers a month. And, uh, so on, and then recently from Daft, I moved to another part of the group um, into adverts, which is like a, a kind of more organised Craigslist. Uh, you can go buy and sell anything, and it kind of has a community element to it. So you know, we encourage feedback, <coughs> we encourage conversation out in the open about the product that's being sold. Um, so I've kind of got a good mix of experience. Um, I started off initially working in a waterfall environment. Before I left Paddy Power, we kind of adopted Agile. So I. <coughs> Agile for about four years, um, and that's kind of what I want to talk to uh, talk to you about today. Is to throw a few ideas that I have about Agile, uh, share with you guys, get some feedback. Um, so I've worked with big Scrum teams, uh, uh, coordinated with other Scrum teams all over the world, and more recently I've worked in much smaller teams, which is where I've got kind of the chance to experiment with things like this. So my talk today is called optimizing your sprints. To to optimizing your sprints to achieve your targets using the 3 to 1 ratio. I should have spent time coming up with a more catchy name, but that's, that's <laughs> what we have. Um, so uh, the outline what I'll cover today is the background, uh, why we needed to come up, up with a 3 to 1 ratio. Then we'll go on to fitting 3 to 1 into your sprint planning. I'll also explain what 3 to 1 is then. Um, and then the impact 3 to 1 has in, in whatever target it is you want to achieve. I've got about 15 minutes. Um, as I'm going throughout it, feel free to ask questions. Uh, if they're related to what's on the screen, far away. If they can wait till the end, uh, I'll give you a chance at the end as well. So, a bit about the background. So, uh, yeah, almost a year ago now, I started in daft.ie, um, and this was the first number that I was faced with. Uh, anybody want to guess what it was? Developer wants to release? No, uh, I'll go answer. <laughs> it was uh, it was the MPS score of our, of our mobile apps. Um, does anybody? <laughs> Screens upside down. <laughs> does anybody use MPS to, to as a KPI? Uh, yeah, yeah. A lot of people do. Most people know what it is, so I, I won't go into the details. Uh, but AD is pretty rubbish. Um, so. Luckily, they did have that open field question. Uh, you know, tell us why you gave us this score. So. Uh, so I looked through the detractor feedback and I kind of pulled some examples. Now, these is kind of from memory, I threw in these quotes. So uh, all, all, the, <laughs> all the detractors were saying things like, you know, kicks me out when I view pictures, um, you know, it's slow to search, uh, this filter isn't working when I try to search, your dev team are rubbish, somebody said. Um, I used that as a, as a quote to kind of get the dev team fired up about, about <laughs> fixing this. Um, the other one was useless compared to my home. That's how I got buy-in off the management to kind of try this idea. Um, and it was, it was all just bad things about that. So the, pro the product was, it was, it was unreliable. Um, it was buggy, it crashed, it was slow. Um, our, it, 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 we used three different APIs. We used an old API, we used an API that's built to replace that, and then we built a newer API which is built to replace that one. So we were using three different APIs. It was a mess, um, and it, it you know, showed in the experience we were giving to our users. Um, so we, 
I filtered all this feedback um, and uh, we kind of ranked it. And the, the thing that was mentioned more often than that was performance. Uh, then we had things like ad details. So people were upset with the amount of detail that guys were putting into their ads. Um, so that's the state agents and landlords, uh, you know, whether it's the quality of the pictures they're putting up or whatever. Uh, the lack of replies to inquiries, um, you'll see it's kind of down in the third spot there. You'll see how that grows in importance later on. That's the equivalent of a recruiter not replying to uh, an applicant and just kind of going silent. Um, and it's kind of a, it was a sign of the times in Ireland that the estate agents and landlords were getting so many inquiries that they didn't need to reply to everybody. They, you know, they, uh, so they didn't, and that really annoyed a lot of users. And then down in, down in Fort, which is kind of sad as a product manager, is the feature requests. You know, there, there's a few mentions. It would be great if it done X, Y, Z, so on. So we kind of threw that into uh, kind of a matrix like this. And when we kind of graphed the performance issues uh, compared to, you know, whether it was zero to six, because this is all the detractors we're looking at, the performance guys were all, all, all giving a zero, one, two. So, you know, they were, they were going to be harder to kind of uh, get up into the uh, passive and promoter, promoter scale. So we, we kind of ranked them as a high impact. Uh, ad details, even though that was the second in the amount of mentions, it didn't have as high an impact. They were kind of given, you know, a four and a f four or five and a six. They were saying, oh, it would be nice if it could do if it could do this. Um, but you know, they weren't too upset about it. Uh, then lack of replies to inquiries. There wasn't too many mentions on it, but this does upset people. If you if you think about the uh, the mindset you're in when you're looking for a house, a lot of people it's their home or they're trying to move somewhere. Um, they're trying to move somewhere because they've got a new job or whatever. Uh, and if they're applying for somewhere to live, you know, somewhere where they go to sleep at night and they're just not getting a reply, it's going to annoy people. So that had a really high impact. These guys were given zeros, ones, twos, and then features down the bottom. A few people mentioned it, you know, it, it wasn't really that high, that high an impact. Uh, so we knew that um, the main thing we needed to do to kind of fix our MPS, because we, 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 we had set a target for MPS that we wanted to achieve by the end of the year. So we knew that the main thing we needed to do was fix the performance issues. That was, that was first on our list. Um, when you think about situations where you've had a lot of bugs, has anybody done a bug smash week, um, a bug smash day even, whatever? Um, we thought about that idea, we kind of threw it around and we said it's going to take us a month to fix all of, all of these issues because we had to do a lot of API work as well. Uh, so we decided we're not going to do that. Uh, bug smash weeks have a horrible impact on morale as well, I found. By the end of it, everybody's dreary. One or two developers have got stuck in a bug that they just can't fix, and it, it, it upsets people. So we decided not to do that. So we needed another process to try to uh, get this performance, get all these performance issues, fit them into our sprints. Um, and we wanted to do it as well without really impacting our kind of product and feature backlog that we had. So everybody has a product backlog. Um, you know, it's your main backlog that you filter through to your, to your scrum teams and, and, and they work on. We came up with the idea of spinning off a target backlog um, and then a developer's choice, which I'll explain in a moment. But the, the target backlog was anything related to fixing the performance. So it was a tweaking the API, it was a bug fix, it was uh, speeding up a page or whatever it was. Um, but the reason I've got a star beside it is because for the 3 two, one method, which I'll explain in a minute, this part of the, the backlog is interchangeable. So this is really going to complement your main backlog. Um, the main backlog you're working on, you've always got company goals and whatever that you want to achieve, uh, but you'll have other, other things like this MPS that we wanted to fix, uh, and that's what your target backlog is. So whatever it is, if it's a kind of a project that snuck up on you out of the blue, you can use this as your target backlog to get it, to get it fixed. Um, and the other, the other thing was developer's choice. So we had a problem because we had so many uh, performance issues, because we had uh, such a long product backlog, uh, estate agents are our main paying customers and they're pretty demanding. They're, it, they're a particular breed of customer, they're very demanding. Um, they're generally not tech savvy, so they don't understand why things take a while. So we had that kind of pressure, um, which meant the developers didn't really have time to work on things. Uh, we done the odd hack day, um, <laughs> where they got to play around with a few ideas or whatever, but they never really got much say into the sprints. So we decided to pull in a developer's choice um, backlog. Um, this could be anything as long as it was aimed towards making the developer's life easier. So it could be um, updating a library that's, that's, that, that's resulting in uh, slow development. It could be refactoring a page that they just don't like dealing with. It's, a, it's an old piece of code. Um, it could be a hack day project that has been signed off, but it's never really going to fit up to the backlog. But whatever. It's a developer's choice. They create the stories themselves. They put it into the backlog. They prioritize it. And it has to be done before sprint planning. Um, so when you fill this out, you know, you've got new features, a uh, new marketing tool that you want to get in, um, you've got your target backlog, which in my case is, th that, that I'm talking about is all related to performance. 
um, and then you've got the developer choice. And the tree to one, oh, so you want to fit that into a sprint, and the tree to one is just, you take three stories from here, two stories from the target backlog, one story from developer choice. Now this could be, I know if you're doing 60 stories, uh, a sprint, which would be pretty good if anybody's doing that. You know, you're, you're, you're going to get 30, 20, and 10, but it's just a ratio. Um, and then when you, does the transition work? It does. Uh, so when you kind of take all them, you get them, and you put them into your sprint. So we kind of started, and this is something we slowly developed over a number of sprints. We didn't just sit down and say, hey, we'll just try this, and we didn't have a ratio printed on the wall and, and measured exactly. We basically just discussed throughout the sprint planning. We said, right, do we have a good mix of the product backlog? Uh, there's these performance issues that we've got a few stories in here that we're going to fix. And guys, is there anything like that you want to tackle, the, tackle this sprint that, that you want to get in? And that's a developer's choice story. So you know, you go through your sprint, you do your retrospective at the end, uh, you discuss what worked, what didn't work, and so on, and then you uh, go on to the next sprint. Um, so we done that for probably about six months. Um, now, you know, we, we we obviously tried a few different things and. Uh, we, we experimented a bit as we went along, but you know that was generally what we what we came up with that worked. Um, so then we have the impact of three, two, one. So roughly six months we tried this, and I was lucky enough to to uh, that, that we were measuring this throughout the month, so we, we could track the impact. So we go back to the graph we had earlier on uh, from the June MPS, uh, which was eighteen. So we we got two or three sprints uh, through. We I think we got one app release on each platform. Um, July it went up one to 19. Uh, performance dropped slightly in mentions. It's still a big uh, driver of uh, dissatisfaction though. Um, nothing else really moved. We go into August. Um, it's dropped a bit more. Uh, by this stage, you know the guys are uh, really powering through these performance issues. They, they, all, they all want to get these fixed. Nobody wants a buggy product that's upsetting customers. Uh, then we went on to September. Something interesting happened in September. Does anybody want to guess? Students. No, um, we, we forgot to run the MPS, um, so, so September's kind of blank, but it's okay, because it means when I'm going through this and I jump on to October, we've got nearly eight weeks, and you can kind of really see the change. Yeah, so performance issues have dropped right down. They're still, at this stage, the, uh, the most mentioned thing. Uh, they've dropped slightly in impact. Um, still the most mentioned thing, but just by a small margin. Um, and I want to note at this point as well, by the time we got, got to October, uh, we had finished uh, our, our target backlog of getting through the performance issues. Uh, we'd fix you know, pretty much 90% of everything we wanted to fix. Um, and it's still kind of up high, um, it, sorry, in the number of mentions. And the reason being, which kind of discovered, is customers have good memories. So when we went through the feedback for October, we noticed that the bugs that they were mentioning, the crashes that they were mentioning, uh, the problems with specific devices, uh, they were things that we fixed to two months ago, or probably even more, three months ago. Um, so customers remember. So they were remembering these things, and they're still kind of rank, uh, ranking these as a big issue. Um, but as it kind of went on, and there was less and less bugs, it dropped low. And this was the first month where the performance wasn't the biggest issue that was coming out of the MPS, which was kind of a big milestone for us. Um, now ad details uh, is cropping up. Lack of replies is, is growing and it's becoming a, it's having a bigger impact on MPS. Um, but all this time our MPS is growing. We're up to 46 at this stage, uh, which was pretty cool. We were all uh, pr pretty happy with ourselves. And then we went into December and January. And by this stage, we're about three months thereabouts. I, I, I don't want to say bug free, but uh, <laughs> you know, uh, very few bugs compared to what we did have. Uh, our API was performing well. Um, the app was performing a lot faster because the developers had time to, throughout these months to kind of refactor the pages as they went along. Um, and performance just it wasn't an issue anymore. By this stage, we weren't even mentioning it. We had fixed it. We were happy. We had to move on to lack of replies to inquiries. This, it, it, that was an interesting one. I, I don't know. I moved on shortly after that to uh, another part of the group. So I don't know what the guys are doing to fix this. It's an interesting one because this is it's not our behavior, it's the customer's be behavior towards other customers, but um, it's happening on DAF, so it's, it's our problem to fix. So it, that's, that was a challenging one, actually. I must catch up with them and find out what they're planning to do to fix that, but that's now the biggest issue that, that, that we need to tackle. Um, so our MPS target, I didn't mention earlier on, uh, our target was 30 by the end of the year. We'd got to 54, which was, uh, we're all pretty happy with, and we had tripled our MPS um, and smashed through our target, which looking back on it was a, a bit low, like, 30 for an MPS target is pretty terrible. 
Um, so we had achieved that, and I've checked in with the guys. They're, 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 some of them are on the same floor as me, some of them are just a floor up, up from me in the office, and I've checked in with them, and it's still growing, um, and performance now isn't even on this chart. It's like way down. Um, and what they do, they still kind of fit in this uh, target backlog, depending on what they work, work on. There was a media sales project uh, where they had a few stories they wanted to get through, and they didn't want it really to impact the main back backlog. So they used it for that, and, and, and uh, they've, they've used it, they've adapted it for, for things like that. Um, and that's kind of it. I only had 15 minutes. I don't think I've gone over. Um, so we'll just run through a quick recap. So. How we, start, how, how we started this uh, was by understanding our users, whether it's MPS or what, whatever, whatever you use, whether it's getting out and talking to users, whether it's a different type of survey, whether it's just a C stats, uh, SAT score through Zendesk, whatever it is, <coughs> you need to understand your users. You need to understand what you want to fix. Um, in our case, it was very easy to identify um, because everybody told us it was the performance issues. Um, but you've, you've got to know that. Uh, then get for the three to one ratio, get three stories from your main backlog. For every two stories from your target backlog, one dev's choice backlog. The next one is really important. This is something I used to do very, very badly. Um, and looking back, I'm actually embarrassed at myself that I didn't. Um, so measure your progress regularly and share it with your full team and stakeholders. It, like my, my, my first manager in product told me that anything we do, we need to be able to measure afterwards, which I've always done. I've, we've always tagged it out with whatever analytics we're using, and we've been able to measure it. But for a long time, I didn't share it. And what happens is when you're, when you're involved with the Scrum teams, uh, if you share with them that, you know, okay, guys, we had these really awkward bugs last week. We fixed them. These customers have come back that we replied directly and said, thanks. Um, look, the, the MPS is growing. If it's a new feature that made you another 10 million, guys, we made another 10 million, let the dev team know, whether, whether it's an email, whether it's thrown on the Slack channel, whether it's walking up, depending on the type of, uh, the type of guy the developer is, you know, whether it's walking up and saying it to him in front of other people, just let them know, share, share with them the impact that they're having on the, uh, uh, on the actual uh, performance of the product. And when you do that, they become so much more invested in it. Um, and it, it just makes such a difference. Um, I've had bad situations with dev teams. For the last couple of years, I've always tend to have a, have a good relationship with them. And it's really because of that. I share as much as I can with them. Um, you know, I, I give them Jews where Jews are due. Um, and then the last one, uh, users have good memories, give them time. So if you're changing anything about your product that is related to the customer's perception of your product, the perception takes time to change. You, you see, and so by the time we got to October, we had everything fixed, but they're still giving out about it, even though it wasn't happening anymore. Uh, so if you do something like this and you target something and it doesn't change straight away, give it another few months, keep measuring it, don't stop measuring it and forget about it and write it off, keep measuring it. Um, and see, see what happens. You know, customers' opinions change over time.